In late July of 2021, several family members were partaking in a joyride on their utility task vehicle when something truly unsettling occurred. Now to this day, the primary witness whom we'll call Reggie is certain that there was something trying to lure them into the cornfield and no, they did not have candy or puppies. <coughs> Reggie and his sister were excited when their cousins came to visit. The teens would work hard and play hard, and on this particular occasion, found themselves riding the UTV past the tall corn stalks as they waved in the summer wind. Now, one of Reggie's cousins was driving, although they weren't going too fast. Now, this is an important detail because it means that the engine was quiet enough to allow them to hear something strange. Now, it sounded like a voice, and Reggie asked his cousin to stop the vehicle long enough to listen, and so they shut the engine off, and there was only a moment of silence before he hears it again. Where are you going? Come back. So Reggie, his sister, and his cousins all exchanged glances. It was a man's voice. Could it have been Reggie's father or his uncle back early from their errands in town? This time of year, the corn had grown far too high to really see anything. And so, did you hear that? Asked Reggie. Everyone nodded and repeated the sentences back to him. And as they did so, the voice called out again, Come back! Reggie ran through the list of possible scenarios in his head. It could be one of their fathers, but that didn't quite make sense. They had just left. Could it be a neighbor? I mean, possibly. The nearest house was opposite from the direction from where they were hearing the voice. And instead of following the calls into the cornfield, the teens then turned the UTV around and headed back home. And when they arrived, they found their mothers who adamantly denied that any of their husbands had come back yet. Now, hearing this, one of Reggie's cousins grabbed a shotgun and they returned to where they had heard the voices. They spent about a half an hour there waiting for someone or something to step out from the stocks or at least call out again, but nothing ever did. There was just the whisper of the crop swaying in the breeze. Now, cornfields are eerie places. It's not entirely clear why. Maybe it's because they are just so thick and impenetrable. I mean, anything could be lurking within them. Just a few feet away, and you would never even notice. And not to mention, they're pretty terrifying if you get lost in. There are places that, except for planting and harvesting, many human beings do not go, and they occupy gigantic plots of land. In fact, in the United States alone, over 94 million acres are dedicated to growing corn. Now, there is even a name for the fear of cornfields, Navarophobia. But where does this fear come from? Perhaps, along with all the possibilities already mentioned, we fear cornfields because we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are unsafe places. Places where anything and everything from our worst imaginations might lurk. I mean, there is no shortage of frightening stories from cornfields. Many are much more dramatic than what Reggie's family experienced. For example, in 2014, a witness who was nine years old at the time had visited his grandfather's house only to spot something that sticks with him to this day. The boy said that a large cornfield sat adjacent to the property. Now, while technically the grandfather's land, he leased it out to a local farmer who paid for the opportunity to use it for crops. Now, one of the boy's favorite pastimes was to play hide and seek in the cornfield like many of us kids would do. Although they were always very careful never to venture more than 10 or 15 rows inside. Now, in my personal opinion, that's already pushing and that's pretty far in. Now, on this particular visitation, it was time to go home, and the boy was waiting alongside his mother's car. Everyone else was inside, or so he thought. Now, soon, he heard something from the cornfield that made him doubt that, and he would say that he had heard his cousin's voice telling him to play hide-and-seek with him, and so he went to the cornfield. Now, to get to the actual cornfield, you actually had to cross a small road. 
Now, he didn't cross the road, but he saw eyes. And what he saw was very low to the ground and reflecting, so he just assumed it was a stray cat. Now, the boy would quickly realize that this wasn't at all possible, and what happened next removed any doubt. He claimed that this thing held out its hand like it wanted him to grab it. And the hand was bony and the fingers were really long, but human-like and he believes that it wanted him to follow it. And so his mom yells back for him and he runs back to the car and he never told anybody about what he saw. He was afraid that his family would think it was another one of his stories since he did kind of have an over imagination, an overactive imagination as a child. But to this day, he doesn't know really what it was. And he hasn't been there since, but he always feels like there's something watching him wherever he goes, whenever he gets near a cornfield. So was this the same type of entity that had beckoned to Reggie and his family from their family's cornfield? I guess a more disturbing question arises. What if they had followed the voice inside? Now, whatever it was, it sounds a lot like another cornfield critter seen in central Illinois during the late summer of 1998. The witness was driving after dark with her husband along a road bordered by cornfields on both sides. Now, she claimed that something ran across the road in front of their vehicle, and it was really no bigger than a toddler, but was white as bone and exceptionally fast. It was also excessively thin, almost skeletal, and looked like nothing she had ever seen before or since. Now, a similar monstrosity was seen emerging from a cornfield all along State Road 13 in Ohio. It was around 1.43 in the morning on July 31st, 2018, and the witness was traveling north of Mount Vernon. Now, suddenly, a humanoid, seven or eight feet tall, very thin, with hairless, dark, tan skin and an elongated oval head would burst out of the cornrows, darting across the highway only around 60 feet ahead of the eyewitness. And so the witness slams on the brakes, but there was no need. As the creature crossed the road in only two or three steps, then vanishing into a darkened soybean field on the opposite side. One of the most unsettling stories regarding cornfields come to us from a witness named Yari, who lives in the American Southwest. She said that she had spent much of the summer after her sophomore year in high school bedridden, recovering from an appendectomy. While everyone else enjoyed the outdoors, she spent most of her days inside while her father and uncle worked the family farm. Only now and then did she manage to sneak outside. Late one afternoon, Yari's father and uncle, Juan, were taking the corn that they had harvested to the local store, leaving her outside in a rocking chair. Now, after a while, the sun set and she would decide to head inside for a bit of dinner. She had just heated up her food and was sitting down to eat her hominy and pozole when something outside caught her eye. Now, she stared out the window waiting for it to happen again, and at last, there it was, a flash of light glimmering through the rows in the cornfield. Now, by now, it was fully dark, and Yari knew that all of the farmhands had already headed home. Now, her curiosity turned to worry as she realized what she was seeing might be a lantern left in the cornfield. If unattended, it could easily catch everything on fire and not only their livelihood, but their home as well. And so after finishing her meal and putting her bowl in the sink, Yari grabbed a flashlight and headed back out the door. The corn was too tall and thick to see anything, and so Yari, by now recovered enough from her surgery to walk a bit, headed out into a small pathway carved between the stalks. And as she panned the flashlight back and forth across the rows of corn, she kept looking for something out of place, but noticed nothing. She knew better than to venture into the heart of the cornfield at night and soon decided that her eyes were just playing tricks on her. Yari was about to turn around and head home when a rustling in the rose to her left caught her attention. She stopped, swung the flashlight in the general direction, saying, Hello? And as she did so, she was met with only silence. 
Hesitantly, Yari pushed aside some of the corn stalks and took a few cautious steps into the cornfield in the direction of the sound. The crop closed in on her from all sides, swallowing her in this green and golden embrace. Now, to her horror, Yari's flashlight would flicker and then completely went out mere feet into the cornfield. It was time to head home, but not before she called out one final time. Hello? She asked, much less confidently than before. Now, Yari would describe what would happen next, saying that what she saw was a shadowy form only two yards away from her, slowly pushing the stalks of corn out of its way. She would slowly back up towards the path, fear beginning to rise throughout her entire body. She's now terrified and she trips on a lump of dirt behind her. And now as this figure is getting closer, she holds up the flashlight to try and protect her face, doing everything she can. And the figure then revealed itself. It was a woman with a young boy standing tightly at her side. The moonlight illuminated her dirty face and worker's clothes. The child with big, sad brown eyes was sucking his thumb. Now, Yari says that she slowly stood back up, noticing that she towered over the mother and managed to find the right words. And in Spanish, she said, hello, do you work for my dad? Now, the woman who was holding a lantern just shook her head and then responded, I came from Mexico across the border. Now, this immediately struck Yari as odd as they were nearly 300 miles from the nearest border crossing. Still, she couldn't help but notice how desperate the pair appeared. And so Yari would ask if they were injured and the woman would just shake her head. She would ask if they were hungry, Yari had wondered. The mother would reply yes and that they hadn't eaten in days except for what they packed. It was then that Yari had offered them soup inside the house and they accepted. And so with her son in one arm and the lantern dangling from the other, the woman followed Yari back to the household. Now Yari admits that this might not have seemed especially wise, but she couldn't deny the fact that both of these strangers looked very tired, exhausted, and starved. Besides, many of her father's workers were undocumented, and she couldn't help but sympathize with the situation that the mother and the child faced. Now, while the soup heated up on the stove, the woman told Yari that her name was Maria and introduced her son as Heberto. Now, she claimed that the two of them had left their small town in Sonora after her husband had died and since they had no family remaining in Mexico. Now, in response, Yari shared how her uncle and parents had made a similar journey, though it had taken them a while to establish their lives. Maria was feeding Humberto some pozole when Uncle Juan arrived, and as his truck crunched up the gravel road leading to the house, Yari urged her visitors to stay put and stepped outside to greet him. Is everything okay, Yari? Her uncle asked as he unloaded some unsold corn from the bed of his truck. Her father remained in the passenger's seat. She would claim that she, everything was fine before adding that, it's just that uh, I found a lady and her son in the field and they looked really cold and tired and I let them in and gave them something to eat. Now, after that, Yari said that her father's expression turned sour. Juan froze in place and she tried to quickly explain the circumstances and how they had come from so far away, how she couldn't just leave them tired and hungry in the cornfield by themselves. But her words, folks, fell on deaf ears. Both her father and Juan pushed past her toward the house shouting, Stay out there, Yari! Her eyes followed them to the door and through the window, she could see that Maria and Herberto were no longer eating soup at the kitchen table. And so she rushed inside behind the men and Yari started to say, I swear they were just here. But her uncle told her to be quiet. And this eerie silence fell over the entire house. Now it was then broken by Yari's father and he whispered, Juan, go get the guns. Now Yari was on the verge of objecting when she heard something up above. It was a creak coming from the ceiling as if someone was upstairs. And so all three of them froze in place, staring up and straining their ears to hear anything above their rapidly beating hearts. And then folks, 
all hell would break loose. Loud, quick footsteps began tromping down the stairs. Yari's father yelled for her to run, and she bolted out the door. Her surgery incision flared with pain as she rushed across the dirt of the yard, trying to escape both whatever she had led into the house and the gunfire that now started filling the room what the heck was going on? Apparently, both Juan and her father had managed to fetch their firearms just in time as a second gun joined in, popping off shots at some unseen threat. Now, finally, Yari felt she had run far enough. She looked behind her and saw the house lit up by flares from the muzzles of the guns, the men of the house scrambling into better positions to defend themselves but she never saw what they were shooting at. Yari resumed her escape, heading for the barn at the edge of the cornfield. After rushing inside, she slams the door shut, barricaded them with a box of tools, sat down on the dirt floor. She's terrified. Her heart's beating rapidly out of control. Her thoughts and her mind are racing, and she listened for what felt like ages as gunfire continued. And slowly over time, the shots became less and less frequent. And finally, all together, they would stop. Now, shortly thereafter, she heard her father's voice. Yari! He would shout. They're gone. You can come out now. And with a sigh of both relief and exhaustion, Yari pulled the tools from in front of the barn door and would step outside. Now, Yari described what greeted her on the other side. She pulled one of the doors open and saw a figure standing in front of her, backlit by the moonlight. And as her eyes began to adjust, she could begin to make out the vertically blinking eyes and sharp rows of smiling teeth occupying what should have been her father's face. She screamed, stumbled back as this imposter pounced forward, she rolled out of its way quick enough to avoid its grasp, causing it to dive straight into the dirt. And she moved as far back from it as she could as she regained her footing. The brain frog from her initial shock had cleared and she remembered the bin of tools. And so she jumps leftwards as this thing tried to attack her, violently crashing against the wall of the barn and failing to catch her. So she grabs a rusty pitchfork out of the bin and held it in front of her. Now, Yari claims that she and the creature circled one another, the pitchfork jabbing out on occasion to keep her attacker at bay. Well, unfortunately, she tripped over something else and found herself on the dusty floor of the barn, completely vulnerable. Apparently, balance isn't one of her strong suits. Now, this abomination took advantage of the moment and pounced forward one final time. And at the very last second, she managed to snatch the pitchfork back up and stabbed it forward, scoring a direct hit right here in its chest. This thing wailed and screamed and collapsed to the ground. And what Yari says she did next sounds like it comes straight out of a horror movie. Do you believe her? Its chest was moving ever so slightly up and down, so she took a shovel and drove it into its neck. And it let out one final cry before going still, frozen in a position of agony. And so she grabbed the bloody pitchfork, limped out of the barn, having hurt her ankle from taking that bad fall. She cocks her head from one side to the other every few seconds to see if another one of these things was lurking in the stocks. Her pitchfork raised and in a ready stance. Now, by the time she made it back to the house, Yari says that the entire place was in complete shambles. Atop from the shattered glass from the back door lay Yari's father, four large claw marks on his chest. Juan was attending to his brother as the red stain crept wider and wider across his shirt. Now, luckily, Yari's father was still alive, although his eyes were closed. And she dropped the pitchfork and knelt down to him and explained that we need to get him to the hospital, she would say to her uncle. And so together they carried her father out to the pickup truck, rushed them to the emergency room. And of course, when technicians asked what had happened, they claimed that a mountain lion had just attacked. And so Yari's father stayed in the hospital for a week and remained in bed for a long time afterward. But it wasn't until much later that he would ask his daughter how she was holding up. And she would just tell him that she's okay and that she was a little shaken up. 
Now, after Yari's father had nodded and paused and then began to speak very slowly, he explained to her that he was going to be honest and explained that he didn't know what those things were, but he's seen them every few years since they had moved up there, but has never been attacked like that. Yari apologized, of course, and she started to say that she never should have let those people into the house, but caught herself. Whatever they were, they were not human. They were simply just masquerading as people to gain trust. And so, of course, her father kept saying, no, 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 it's not your fault. Apparently that those things can make themselves look however they want to, to trick you into feeling bad for them. And that's how they lure you in. And he explained to her his regret on not telling her before. And of course, she's nodding and explaining to him that one of these things attacked her in the barn and that she only opened the door because she thought it was her father and even looked like him. And up until now, she had only told Uncle Juan about her encounter in the barn, after which the body had completely vanished. Now, of course, after looking very concerned at her, he gripped her hand tightly, fighting tears, and he whispered to her, I think those are the things that took your mom. Now, upon hearing this, dozens of thoughts ran through Yari's mind, and she would explain that a cold wave ran throughout her body. All of her nerves felt like they had ceased to work. She felt such a strong mixture of emotions that she couldn't even cry. All she could do was just stare at her father. Her mom vanished when she was only four, and her dad woke up one Saturday morning, and she wasn't in bed next to him. And so he figured she was cooking breakfast, so he went downstairs. But everything was not as it seemed. Everything was silent. There was no sign of a forced entry. Both of their cars were in the driveway. And so he and Yari's uncle looked all around the farm before finally calling the police. And they searched for her for months, looking all over the county and putting missing persons posters practically all over the state. Now, some suspected that she may have run away, but Yari's father knew that she loved him far too much to abandon them altogether. But unfortunately, they never found a trace of her. It almost broke Yari's father, but he knew that he had to take care of his daughter, so he just kept moving. Now, Yari's father filled in some of the missing gaps and would claim that they kept hearing this strange wail somewhere in the field that entire night, and Juan and him were able to sleep through it, but that there were complaints about how it was making her head hurt. And so he thinks that maybe she went outside to go get a breath of fresh air or investigate the sound, and, well, you know how that works. And of course, her father's voice would trail off, and he clearly didn't need to explain any more. She had already knew the rest. And together, they wept for a long time before Yari finally left his bedroom. Time passed, and eventually, Yari's father had recovered, and activities at the farm seemed to return to normal. Summer continued out into autumn, and the corn was harvested from the fields. Now, to celebrate the event, Yari's father and Juan held a big party for all their workers complete with a potluck and a mariachi band played by some of the farmhands. Now, Yari doesn't remember much of the party because the celebration was undermined by what she saw that night, and she concluded her wild story with the following. Now, at about two in the morning, all of the workers had gone home, and her uncle and her were cleaning up. And as she was sweeping the dining room and washing the dishes, she, she was joking with her uncle about how drunk one of the mariachis had gotten and how his trumpet had sounded like a dying animal by the end. And so she looks out the window above the sink for just a moment between laughs, and she swears she saw a flickering light amidst the stalks. Our final cornfield story comes to us from a UFO researcher, Ryan Sprague, who retold the encounter of Chase Klotsky, who's a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, I like to say, in his 2020 book, Somewhere in the Skies. On April 20th, 2010, Chase was dispatched by MUFON to investigate a series of sightings unfolding in Tennessee. Witnesses here were reporting red and white lights up to 27 at a time, bobbing and darting over the farmland near their small town. In addition to these, some had spotted dramatic fireballs whizzing across the night sky. Now, eventually, Chase's research led her to one local resident who seemed to be experiencing an inordinate amount of activity on his property. 
and when she finally got in contact with him, Chase said that the witness seemed especially rattled. He and his cousin had begun nightly vigils to try and capture evidence of the UFOs on camera. Now, only a few days passed before Chase received another phone call from the witness. He told her excitedly, Last night, I saw three distinct points of light that formed a triangle. There are helicopters buzzing around this morning. In all my years living here, I have never seen helicopters in this area. It's like they're searching for something. Now, deep inside, Chase knew that she had found a good lead. The witness was a prominent, successful businessman in his community and wouldn't risk his reputation if he wasn't genuinely seeing something out of the ordinary. Now, soon, she and her research partner had secured permission to visit the witness's property. Now, when the MUFON investigators had arrived on the site, the sun was well on its way below the horizon. And after a quick introduction, Chase asked the witness where he had been seeing the strange lights. And to her amazement, he replied, well, there's one now. Following his finger with her eyes, Chase saw a tiny light lingering among the clouds, and so she and her fellow investigator quickly accepted the witness's offer to take them closer in his pickup truck. Now soon, the vehicle was tumbling into a harvested cornfield where thousands of six-inch tall corn stalks still stood. Now when at last they were at a spot closer to the light with better visibility, Everybody began piling out of the truck and began setting up their equipment. Simple gear like flashlights, cameras, binoculars, and telescopes, along with more sophisticated instruments like laser dot thermometers, digital recorders, tri-field meters, and magnetometers. As they were setting up, more lights just kept popping up and appearing, and one light seemed to draw closer and closer until Chase abandoned the preparation in order to get photographs. However, all of the batteries and their cameras, fully charged when they arrived, drained instantly. All of the other equipment failed as well, mere moments before these white lights manifested around the red light at the center in a triangular formation. The stars within this space had blotted out, giving the impression of a gigantic craft slowly gliding closer. Then, without warning, the entire apparition silently shot off across the sky, letting the stars return to their ordinary positions. Chase would say this, that there was no hiding the excitement. I quickly turned my attention back to the equipment. It seemed to be working now. That's when I started to feel this uneasy feeling. It was quickly growing uncomfortable. And so I asked, does anyone else feel like they are being watched? And I don't mean from above. Now, both the witness and her fellow investigator would nod in agreement. No sooner than they had acknowledged this feeling than a wave of terror gripping them. As quietly as possible, everyone packed up their equipment and began to run as fast as they could back out of the cornfield, snaking through the rows and hoping not to sprain an ankle. Don't be like Yari, guys. And suddenly, the witness came to a complete stop. It was so sudden that Chase ran into him at full speed, and he shouted, What the F is that? Now Chase looked over his shoulder and shone her flashlight up ahead. The light played across the low stalks and dark soil, tracing a pathway forward until at last it settled there on a figure no more than three feet tall, staring in their direction. Chase described her emotions in Ryan's book, saying this, it is the one second that completely changed so much for me, one second of time that to this day still haunts me. My mind always traces back to the two immediate thoughts. The eyes of this being, they were not the large black almondy eyes that are usually reported. I was also shocked at the size of the legs. They were very thin and twig-like. I honestly remember thinking a very conscious question to myself, they're so thin, how do they hold up the body? No one waited around to answer these questions. Now in a full-fledged panic, they made a direct path towards the truck, jumping inside, and the witness would crank the ignition, take off across the cornfield, back in the direction of the house. No one said a word until they arrived back in the driveway, and after exiting the vehicle, the witness would ask, what was that? He received no answer from the investigators. His knees buckled and he placed his hands on his legs to steady himself, staring at the driveway. And finally, 
He managed to lift his head once more. I'm not crazy, right? He would ask. You saw it too, didn't you? And finally, Chase found the words. Yeah, she answered. Yeah, I saw it. What does it want? The witness would ask again. And words once again failed Chase. And soon they left. But activity at the property continued in the weeks to come. Scores of ufologists would descend upon the location, creating what some likened to a circus atmosphere. Before long, fearing for his reputation, the witness started discouraging researchers until, at last, he solely continued communication with Chase. Now, eventually, the witness's wife said that the entire affair was taking too great a toll on their family. And Chase said that she couldn't make it stop. She could only uphold her original promise to keep the family's names anonymous. Reflecting on that night in the cornfield, Chase maintains that it truly shook her understanding to the core, both that of the reality and the phenomenon itself. She finds herself amazed at how she stumbled upon the holy grail of ufology, a witness of multiple objects in the sky and a close encounter of the third kind. In fact, she would tell Ryan Sprague this, that it was not only surreal, but quite frankly, unbelievable. What do you do with that? You tell the truth of what was seen and admit that even as the witness, you find yourself having a very hard time processing it all. I truly won't stop until I find answers. And because you guys made it this far, I want you to all comment down below, lost in the corn. So that way I know who made it to the end of the video and well, who didn't. And if you guys enjoy this kind of content, be sure to go ahead and slap that big old red like and subscribe button for more content just like this from yours truly. As always, I love you all. Keep it up in mind, and I'll see you guys in the very next episode.